Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to Social Chat. I'm Michelle Stinson Ross, and I am here with my partner in crime and analytics. Can I call you a guru, Alan? Is that fair? <laughs> I, I personally hate the term guru, authority, <laughs> expert. I can handle guru. I don't expect people to climb a mountain. And I, I told you I would start this thing and still forget to hit pause. <laughs> well, I, I remember it and I paused it so I can see the chat window. All cool. right. Now, this is so fantastic. We're goofing off. We're, we're being a little bit silly, but hello, everybody, and welcome because tonight we are talking about marketing case studies. And Alan and I both have a lot to say on this one, even if it is just the two of us. Hello, Andrea Kochikaru. So, for those of you watching along, playing along at home, you have a couple of options to interact with us as we discuss case studies tonight. You can interact with Andrea Kochikaru live on Pound Social Chat on Twitter. You can also jump into the live um, text chat that's happening on YouTube to ask questions, leave comments, um, maybe share some of your favorite case studies. Ball's in your court, guys. Be yeah, free links. to interact and let us know what you think as we're live. And yes, I'm in my backyard today because on Saturday, I noticed late in the afternoon, my air conditioner had broken. We had, for, for Toronto, it was a, what we would call a mini heat wave. It's now starting to break, fortunately, but it was in the 90s, plus humidity. So my house got really hot. The air conditioner got fixed late this afternoon around 4 o'clock. So the house is still in the, well, where my office is, is in the mid-80s. So I figured it's better for me to be out here in the backyard. And this way you can see, you know, some nice greenery behind me. Well, you're you're taking care of what Kevin Mullet usually does for us. I mean, Kevin's yeah, I got the backyard and, and the hammock. A, and a pond and acreage, I think. I, I <laughs> I'm in a suburban backyard, so I don't quite uh, have luxury here. But yeah, the woods behind me, you know, so nice thick greenery as a backdrop. It was either that or the, the bricks on the house. I figure this is a better backdrop. I like it. So I'm hoping everybody's doing that. Uh, all right. I'm just seeing, uh, hopefully we're getting a few people coming in on this uh, in the next little while. So let's get started. So we're going to talk, and I, w Michelle and I will be swapping questions back and forth. We appreciate if you want to, please put in the on the stream, join in and put some commentary there and we will read them out. And if you have questions for us, hit us up as well. So my question is to Michelle and whoever's listening and watching us, how do you regularly for, for Michelle's case for her clients, and I'll talk about my clients. The question is, do you or do they regularly have case studies within their current marketing plan? For us and the clients that I've been working with lately, no, because the company that I've been working with is a startup. And the, there's a whole bunch of incremental things that we're going to bring on. I have a feeling that case studies and white papers and things like that are probably not going to happen until next calendar year. We're still trying to sort out some of our basic internals and some of the things that are necessary just from a marketing operations side. We're, we're still implementing a lot of things. But that's part of the reason why I wanted to discuss case studies because I would like to actually do an internal case study for us to look at, you know, how have things progressed in the last six months? What What's worked? What hasn't? How can we tweak as we begin to implement more of our marketing scheme? All right. Well, from my end, uh, the project, I'm, big project I'm wrapping up on, which actually involved outdoor advertising, they do not have case studies. I put forward the idea that they're out there selling advertising. Like we have these special outdoor billboards which have facial recognition, all this other stuff, but they haven't put a case study together because they're having a hard time with their current advertisers who actually want to take advantage of doing things like A B testing and so forth. So they have it on their list for when there's an advertiser willing to do that A B testing, but for right now they're more gung ho on can we sell this? 
just to give better analytics data to the advertiser and it and they you know they can charge more so it doesn't do a good case study people who do this were willing to pay more that's not working for them uh as an agency i i go i'm in your shoes uh michelle where creating a white paper or a case study really hasn't been there we've in the past and i've used our blog posts to talk about success and and facebook and some youtube things like saying hey we came across this problem dumb you know dumb old seo or gee they missed this and it really you brought up a good point could have put those into a white paper and put them on my you know website mm -hmm. so that is something yeah the last company and this is going back way too long was a software company in the data warehousing space and that was their primary focus everything was a white paper it was we have to write a white paper slash case study of people who use our product and what benefits they were getting from them and that was an important tool for their sales team not so much that people were coming to the website and downloading and reading it as a sales lead but it seemed to work as a sales aid that sorry some fly just landed on my head <laughs> uh, but the choice of being outside but that it was really they had salespeople who would follow up on sales lead did you get a chance to read our white paper let me send you our white paper give it a read i can follow up because they were selling you know at the time i can't remember but it was you know a fifty thousand minimum installation type product you know to you know a couple hundred thousand dollars it was worth the money to invest it gave an example of how to use their product and you know some of the benefits that somebody got out of it and so it was a great sales tool so that you know that really is do white papers or case studies work in the service industry when you're selling a and this is a good question for us to debate back and forth Michelle. if you're selling a new a better handle and a better balanced hammer which you know hey get our hammer our study show that the person who used to be able to drive an average of five nails a minute can actually now do eight nails a minute there's an roi benefit to a carpenter mm -hmm. <laughs> he's hammering a lot of nails of course now we'll have electric you know an air, a compressed air hammer so it's a uh, electric nail driver but that's the type of thing that is very easy but will it work in a case study well we went in we did x y and z for you americans x y and z for us canadians and we got these results is that really a case study because are those results replicable so that's the question to you do you think for the service industry is it worth creating a case study Good question. And Andrea is pointing out there are still way too many companies that don't even bother. And I have to, it kind of begs the question for me, if we're going to be data-driven marketers, if everything is about making sure that not only are we doing the right things, but we're measuring and making sure that we're doing the right things, then why aren't we doing case studies? We're collecting all this data. How hard is it to you know, develop and write a case study based on the data that we collect? Yeah, and that's one of the things as my, when I put my SEO hat on, which I have a collection of hats out here, uh, I find it very difficult when I thought about doing a case study write-up because every client is unique unless I only cover major steps. From my analytics hat, where I go in and I audit, let's say an audit, and I go in and I find all these errors and misconfigurations in their Google Analytics or whatever analytics tool they make, they're using and I can show that we got the more accurate data which improved decision making is that a case study because I may gave them better quality data for decision making but did they make better decisions so that's where I get to the stumbling block mm -hmm. uh, you know and with SEO yes I can do an audit and we have to leave it to the client to implement now if a client hires me and we work on we develop from you know from build a website write the copy to produce it do the content we can show, wow, we did this for them. It's very difficult. Or you go in and you start fixing things. But the damages that somebody may have done to their website is not a, you know, it's not a hammer. That I get a better hammer. I get a something that, you know, increases, you know, machine on an assembly line. It's not a piece of software that automates a process or streamlines a process, reduces the labor costs and something. So I really find it hard to do a case study. But you know, what's, what are your thoughts? Is you think we are collecting great data 
And is it, is it, or is it going to just turn into a raw, raw, raw? Well, I, what's wrong with a raw, raw, raw for, for sake of <laughs> a better way of putting it? Um, and, and I ask that because um, for those of us, maybe not necessarily internally, but I, I can make a case for internally as well. But when you're talking about a marketing department doing a case study about how steps, changes, whatever made an impact, then yeah, I think that there is certainly a reason for kind of tooting your own horn and, and going, look, we studied these sets of data. We know that if we tweaked this particular aspect of what we were doing, we had a hypothesis that, you know, certain things were going to happen. We tweaked them, we tested, we tried it out. Guess what? Our hypothesis was correct and we were able to boost visibility, boost sales, boost traffic, what, whatever the goal was to begin with. Um, I think for decision makers, whether that's internally, um, as a marketing department or whether it's, you know, adding to your portfolio as a small agency or an independent consultant that yes, there is definitely a reason for collecting all of that data and going, Oh, look, we actually can do what we say we can do with this stuff. Um, it, it's just a way of putting together a proof of who we are, what we do and why it's valuable to continue investing in, digital marketing, social marketing, content marketing, email marketing, whatever that may be. All right. So I think we're getting some, you know, good value concepts for people here. So now comes the big question. Uh, you know, get, getting into this a lot earlier, I'm going to hear my neighbor's got his hose going. So if you hear squirting water, it's not me. <laughs> uh, the joys of outdoors. Mark, uh, thing. So what is... What is it that makes for a good case study slash white paper? What do you perceive makes you're going to sit down and write a white paper about your consulting business? Maybe it's a white paper, maybe it's a case study. And I don't know, maybe before we get into it, do people do, should we differentiate the, the two? What's the difference between a white paper and a case study? Well, uh, go ahead and define that one for them. <laughs> well, a case study to me is literally what it says, case study. We went to client, We our customer was client X. Client X had, now we're getting into this next part, you know, had a problem. They bought our solution and they're happy as can be because that got Y results. To me, that's mm -hmm. a case study. Right. We talked. A white paper to me is a technical document which usually doesn't go to the purchasing department. It goes to the person investigating the service or product. Will this work? So a white paper is much more of a technical spec. So if you're selling a piece of software, what platform? Does it run on iOS? Does it run on Windows? Is it available at both? Does it have to be on uh, Red Hat? How, what, how does it license? How does it structure in? How does it integrate? It is, and what can it do? I almost think of it like a car brochure. Nobody gives you a case study when you go to you go to a uh, you know General Motors or Ford's website. They don't give you a case study of what you know this person was happier because they bought you know whatever car they bought. Sure. But they, technical specs about the wheels, the options that are available, the fuel economy. They're giving you a whole variety of information that to me that's, as you know, it's not a white paper, but as close to it as I can think of as something that we're all familiar with. Well, and, and you're, you're close to the same things that Andrea is mentioning over in our chat. She says, where a case study is a very specific example of a client, a particular client's problem, how we solve that problem, a white paper is more of a broad subject matter overview. So if I were going to make the distinction, a white, um, a white paper might be just generally about, say, email marketing. Um, different things that I as a consultant or you and I as an agency would implement in order to improve 
um, email marketing across the board. It, it is a broad treatise on things that we do when it comes to email marketing. Whereas a case study would obviously be a very specific example of how a particular client came to us with a very particular problem about email marketing. We discussed what that problem was, how we thought we could solve it, what we implemented, and then how all of that worked out. So in being in the consulting field, I don't feel white papers are appropriate for us because we are going to be giving a step-by-step -step guide of our process, which is what a white paper does. Mm -hmm. And we're basically giving away our personal trade, in our, our trade secrets. We're not talking about a piece of software where the code is the secret, how it and what it integrates with is open. You can have screenshots of the results. You know, yeah, the a limited white paper would be being myself doing an SEO. It would be my our SEO. Here's our white paper. Our pros, our white paper of our, my SEO process. Audit website. Write up recommendations. Work with client to implement. You know, uh, recommendations. Monitor for results. Tweak. You know, rinse and repeat. It's not telling anybody anything earth shattering and that it's thing. I think it'd be better is work with client. We identify several key issues on their site through an audit process, work with them to prioritize and implement for the greatest results, resulting in a you know 20% increase in organic search traffic within three months. That to me is a case study and I think be more right. appropriate. Would you agree on that one? I, I actually, I do. Um, yeah, for me, a, a, a lot of what process. we do that might be considered white paper material is what we do as consultants on our websites. So we we outline exactly what it is we do, how much it's going to cost, those sorts of things, but we don't go into the actual nuts and bolts because for one thing, like you said earlier, each client's, you know, situation and circumstances is different. So I might approach one client one way and another client a completely different way because you know, one client's a B2B client and one client's a B2C client. There, already there's quite a bit of difference, but then, you know, one client may be wanting to do a lot more with media buying where, you know, the client over here is wanting to, you know, reboot their brand and, you know, update their website and, and things like that. So the various things that I might work with are so few, you know, spread and different that I really can't, I wouldn't want to do a white paper on exactly how I do this because as clients go, I might do it once and then never do it exactly that way again anyway. Yeah, I agree. So we're, so as consultants, I think case studies, I think we're in agreement that case studies are going to be definitely a more effective means of getting across what we're capable of as consultants and mm -hmm. the results that we have driven to our things. So, okay. Now they're both so, and we've agreed that white papers are technical documents. I'm liking, you know, Andrea, and you know, close as you might get to what. Yo, I like this. Uh, this is from yeah, Joel. Joel. Close you might get is what to expect from a website audit or something like that. Totally agree that case study means more in that scenario. So we're in agreement here, but for certain industries, we definitely have needs for white papers and you know and Andrea put it real white papers oh there we go we're getting a bit of white papers are tech spec brochures and that's great if you're selling a physical product or software product not a service so and that's pretty much going to give technical specifications so what makes a good white paper if you give all the technical specs that any potential customer who's doing an evaluation looks for Okay. Well, yeah. you had That's asked you had asked the question a little bit earlier. So, what constitutes a really valuable case study to you? We wanted to kind of get into the nitty gritty of, of when is a case study a little too thin on information? When is it too much information? Where is the balance of, you know, a good case study that provides the information that anybody generally might need without going overboard? All right, well, I'm going to start with, to me, one of the most important things when I read a case study. I hate it, and I see too many organizations do this, where they say, we did X for a client, and they never give me the name of the client, so I can't go and validate that. And that's a tricky part, because many clients don't want people to know who they use as a consultant. Mm -hmm. 
because they're worried someone's going to usurp their, you know, the consultant who helped them. So, or they don't want to give away that they used a consultant to do this and what that did. So that's a tricky part. So to me, first and foremost, you have to say who you did the work for. And it's not fair to say, worked with one of the five leading banks in the United States. Yeah. Who? It doesn't validate that. It's better to say, working with Chase Manhattan Bank, we identified a problem. So that is the hardest part to go and negotiate with your clients. Right. So to me, that is first and foremost to make sure that you have a great case study. Next is, and I already saw, and Joel, once again, his, we have once we identify the pro we have to say what problem they were having, what the solution was, and I would say even what the the steps in coming up with that solution were. That you know, let's say from an SEO, ran an audit, identified twenty problems, identified the then reduced it down to the five most challenging or most rewarding ones. Client then worked over three months to implement the changes. And you, if you could list what the problems were, net result was, you know, increased organic search traffic 30% and there's my solution. And put a nice chart that's saying, here they implement it and look, six, three months later, traffic's up 30%. That to me from an SEO standpoint is saying, wow, they tell me who their client was. They told me they found 20 problems, but they got this out of five. You could even say, then over the next six months, they implemented all remaining uh, recommendations. And look, traffic's now up 80%. Woo! Mm -hmm. Well, and Andrea makes a good point. She says, detailing the problems is a great way to relate to the audience that will eventually consume that case study. Um, obviously, pain points resonate with people. And if they can identify with, oh my gosh, I have seen this so many times on my own site, on you know, our team's efforts, our whatever, as soon as they can identify with a pain point, you've got them. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just looking at my, the, my backdrop is getting darker and darker. Just, <laughs> by the way, it's summer now, everybody here in North America. Welcome to summer. I think it's I forgot to welcome everyone to summer because I think it started here on the East Coast at like 6.55 p.m. or something. So for you, Michelle, that would have been 5.55 or something. But we're definitely all into summer here. So welcome to summer and that and the longest day of the year. The sad always scares me on days like today. And here's our case study. Days are going to start getting shorter. Aww. I always argue, but when, 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 when summer should start, to me, this should be the middle of summer, not the <laughs> start of summer. <laughs> but anyway, so but I think we had some great points coming in, and I, I like the comments that we got, you know, from Joel and from Andrew. As you know, what Andrew's saying, it's how it relates to your audience. Yes, you don't want to talk about in a case study a unique problem that the client had that you might only run into one in 10,000 times because. In that opinion, someone's like, oh, well, we know we don't have that problem. But if it's something such as we, you know, and then let's say a common SEO mess up is that we identify the URL structure was too long, too complicated, and there was not properly, you know, managed in their cross-linking strategies. Everyone goes, wow, yeah, we got that problem. <laughs> And we came and we developed, you know, worked with their technical team to develop a much more straightforward, simplified solution, making it easier for the site to be crawled. Ooh, that works. Great. And that's where, you know, put it, also put things into layman's language because, once again, a case study isn't being read by technical people. Mm -hmm. It's being read by buyers. And if I get into using complex, talking about the uh, admin, you know, they had over put up security, what left, right, and center, whatever it is that was blocking bots. They the person reading may not even know what a bot is. So if we talk about the bot was having problems crawling this site, they're going, you know, use words that the everyday guy, a technical person knows that you mean it's the search engine bot. But the, when the search engine were visiting the site, they were running into dead ends and abandoning the crawl of the site. People can relate to whether they're technical or non-technical. So mm -hmm. I think that is an important part in any case study. Now, whether it's my analytics, 
you know, if I say they uh, were not did not have their analytics code properly structured and were over calculating data or were under counting things, people can understand that. I don't have to get into that they had the wrong include and exclude filters that hadn't been updated. Only a real geeky analytics person is going to know what I'm talking about. Gotcha. Um, Alan, would you mind switching over to your Hangout window because your camera is trying to discern what the deal is with the light. <laughs> so if you wouldn't mind checking that. Um, I wanted to point out, Andrea uh, circled back around and said, in the end, providing the best practices that can be replicated is important to a case study. And absolutely, this is something that res her comment resonates with me because Social chat for me has always been a discussion of the best practices in marketing, um, whether it was particular to best practices on Facebook or Twitter or whether it was broader best practices in digital marketing. But uh, providing something that will enable you know the reader to see, oh, okay, this is how you solve that is very important as being a part of a valuable case study. Yeah, I'm just sorry. I'm just trying to get to my camera feature here. Turn camera off. I don't want to turn off. No, sorry, guys. <laughs> this is the joys of outdoor. Uh, and I have no camera control in the YouTube live components. So, no problem. This is part of being live on YouTube. <laughs> so, I'm going to try and move a little closer to that little light that comes off my laptop. <laughs> But yes, because if I step back is where the problem happens. So right. I need I need more light reflecting off my bald head. <laughs> the only good part of not having hair here, I can reflect the light back. So great. So we're I think we're getting pretty close in agreement. Uh, you know, and, you know, Andrea is picking up on your point. You know, does providing marketers with best practices? Yeah, we got to be careful that when we're giving best practices that we're not giving away our trade secrets. So that's, you know, as I say, that's one of the hardest parts of writing a good case study is we have to give enough details that sh show as consultants, we know what we're doing, mm -hmm. but we can't give so much detail that a competitor can go and do it on themselves or w even worse, the client who was thinking of hiring goes, oh, well, they just gave me everything I need to know. I have complicated URL structure. Okay, tech team, simplify the URLs. And they're going to do it wrong nine out of ten times but they just think it's a simple solution and well you just gave it away for free why should i pay you and i think that is one of the dilemmas we run into as consultants when we do put things in case studies mm -hmm. it's you know you and i and uh, our other hosts here uh kevin who's at uh, social pro right now giving away a wealth of knowledge for free because he doesn't get paid to be there uh you know, it's not free to the attendees who pay, you know, to attend, but it's one of the dilemmas you and I always talk about is I'm in, you know, I can go speak at this conference. I got to pay for my airfare there. I got to pay for my hotel, my food. When I get there, I get to go on stage and I get to give away tons of information to peers. who are now going to take that information and, okay, I've blacked out again. And, and very quickly, you know, be my competition. Now, by the same token, I'm at that conference and I hope to attend sessions where I will go and learn something and I can go and return the favor of using their feedback or whatever information. But that is one of the dilemmas we're all facing. And that's a really fine balancing point when creating that white paper. Mm -hmm. Ooh, live, yes. <laughs> My outdoor patio light's enough for me to see, but not enough for it to... Uh, I may try and change my angle here. So forgive me and keep talking while I well, see right. this. And, and I get what you're saying. It, it is, it's a fine balanced walk. And the challenge is not giving away proprietary information, but to share strategy and not detail. And it absolutely can be done. Thank you, Andrea, for posing it so concisely for me. Um, but at the same time, this is a case study. And in a lot of ways, we are making the case for why you should hire us as professionals. And, and I'm saying I'm saying the collective us because it's not just me and Alan, but it's all of you watching social chat. This is your opportunity to make the case for why you should be doing what you do rather than somebody else doing what you do, right? 
And there is a great way to walk somebody through the process of this is how we solve problems here. And here is how we consistently gain marketing traction, sales traction, whatever the case may be, um, by being professionals that know what we're doing. Right, Alan? Right. And I think we got a couple comments here. So we got, you know, Joel, uh, Hack Joel Hackman, uh, Heckman, uh, summed up great. It's not too different from, from working within a team slash company environment. You want to be valuable but you want everyone to succeed. Mm -hmm. So we have to be valuable, but we want people to succeed. We want people to be able to identify they have a problem. And by hiring us, we can help them, you know, get a solution. But we also want, you know, somebody else wants to read what we're doing. Great. But once again, and this goes back, Andrea retweeted, uh, put something in the post. You can talk strategy, but not how to do it. So that is the key. Once again, these stupid flies are getting in my head uh, <laughs> is, but it's, we got to give strategy. We got to give mm -hmm. high level, potentially steps, but we don't give the nitty gritty. We did an audit. We're not saying what, how to do a so an analytics audit or a social media audit or a content marketing audit or an SEO audit or any other of the audits that we could be doing. We're just saying, oh, sorry, that was I think a black fly. Uh, and then we want to get involved with. As a result of this, we identified several things. Here were a couple key ones we did, and we resolved these And after implementing it. So I think that's great. And then, oh, we got some other things. Uh, not, Andrew, Andrew, uh, not all businesses are the same. Not all will be applicable. Great. And then I like this. Mention that case study is dependent on data collected. I mean, be right. different for each company implementing strategy. Great. So we have to say, we have, so when you do an audit, we audited the available data and based on that data and make that statement, not all companies have all this data. Or even if you had, we were only able to collect 50% of the data we normally like to receive in this case. So there's an opportunity even to show how good you are that you were able to make some decisions when there wasn't all the data. Right. I, I wanted to point out something that Joel said. He said, you know, in working internally, um, with a team and a company. Now, he was referring to how you support a team and give them information and make sure that the whole team is being successful. But at the same time, I wanted to point out that case studies aren't just for consultants to put out there to get more clients back in. There are reasons for doing internal case studies as well so that your marketing team internally in the company can provide some really good, very really succinct information for decision makers. So consider that internally, if you're working in-house for a brand, for an organization, you can do case studies that help your decision makers see, oh, okay, this this thing that we tested that we've never done before, but you know, we we gave the marketing team a chance to try something new. Here are the results. And actually this was this was actually pretty good and we want to act, you know, formalize this and turn this into our reg part of our regular process. You know, it's valid. One of the clients I was doing that we were trying they have an app and they were trying to do different types of advertising to increase app downloads. Well we did a, some A-B testing. We found the ads that were working. We optimized the keywords. The reality was, yeah, it increased the downloads. But when we showed the final numbers was what the cost to get those increased downloads were, it wasn't worth the effort. So internally, it's not a problem. And it may be a beneficial thing to report case study failures. Mm -hmm. It's not that you know, know what you're doing. You're actually demonstrating what you know, that you did a limited test. This was the result. Here's what it cost. We don't recommend proceeding this because cost of acquisition was too high using this channel. We believe doing an alternative option where this money be better spent. And you know, admitting failure, and in that case not a failure, it was a success. We found the best way to do it, but it still cost $8 to get a download. And the ROI on that was ridiculous where other opportunities cost far less that they could increase that download which involves content marketing driving people to a website where there was great content and by the way we can pop up an ad here download you love our content get it in an app <laughs> and, and the cost of that 
was, you know, let's say $3 per download. Once we actually had made sure I had the analytics in place, so we knew that this came from our content marketing efforts and that they were clicking to download the app. Right. Meanwhile, right. you know, just people come and read your content has value, but is it as valuable if they don't download your app because your goal is to get the app because you have plans for it once you reach a critical mass. So there's, you know, all sorts of opportunities to do internal case studies, which I forgot to mention. Well, and like you said, sometimes reporting on the quote unquote failure, I, I can't tell you how many times I've worked with a company that somebody had a pet, whatever they, they wanted to do a certain aspect of something in a certain way. And no matter how many consultants, how many agencies they've had in and they just, you know, couldn't seem to get over this pet thing that they just had to do all the time. Sometimes that internal case study is helpful to say, okay, we we continued doing, you know, manager ABC's um, pet project over here, but we AB tested it against um, a few options for the similar goal of whatever the case may be, and found that Although Manager ABC's pet project yielded whatever, if we tweaked it and did this, it yielded, you know, this much more of the result that we were actually looking for. Um, there are ways to do internal case studies. And in, now, granted, I, I wouldn't write it in that way. We wouldn't want to be bashing somebody's pet project. But sometimes taking the A-B testing that you normally do in a process like this and actually writing it up the results as a formalized case study kind of helps decision makers kind of get over the hump and go, oh, I see where you're going with this now. Right. Don't bash your boss. Don't bash somebody else's boss in the organization but go around them so you say, hey, they, we, we really love these rails, but we wanted to see if we could do better. Right. right. And guess what? We did. <laughs> and here <laughs> were our results. Not to say that they were getting bad results. We just got better results. Mm -hmm. and, and if you want to stay not, you know, so we recommend, you know, keep, they're not having bad results. So it's, you know, still has a positive ROI, but we suggest you maintain both. Now, when it goes to, their boss, boss or whatever, they go, why are we running both? Why don't we just throw all the money into this one? That's their decision, not yours. You didn't recommend it. Right. You just you just led them to that uh, channel. Okay. I can Certainly. see the sun, the sun starting to set. That's to the south for me, by the way. So what little light's left. You know, this neighborhood's getting dark very quickly. So I'm going to try one more rotation here. <laughs> very see well. All right. So obviously for you guys, one of the things we're trying to help you see is there is – actually a really good reason to take that extra little step of effort and not only collect all the data, not only analyze it, not only act on it, but write up that story as to what was the problem, you know, how did we go about solving it, what were the results, and actually formally stating that case. So I've kind of already hinted at it, but Alan, so what are the parts that actually make up a good formal case study, whether you're doing it externally or internally, um, what points, highlights, whatever, um, should we not miss when we're doing one of these? Okay, well, well, one is, I'm gonna work it backwards. The results, put the data of the results you know, and make it really clear. That is foremost. And then you also want to start with the hypothesis. Why are you writing this? So start with why am I doing this case study? People want to know why am I why am I going to bother reading this? It's not mm -hmm. like we thought we'd look into a search engine optimization. Yeah, so no, you want so you want to start with we have a need to increase organic search traffic because Organic search traffic converts at a rate of 20% compared to all paid media, which converts at 5%. But all our traffic is, you know, current search and traffic only represents 2% of our traffic. And we feel that if by increasing organic search, we could, you know, take that up to 10% of 
okay, I understand why you want to do this. So why you want to do this case study, why you're going to do it. And at the end, you want to say, here are our results. And what you stick in the middle, it's like making a great sandwich. I don't care what your best cold cuts or best veg, freshest lettuce. If you take that first bite and you have stale bread, the sandwich fails. You have some great tasting bread that's wrapped around it. Even so-so cold cuts still taste good. And that's the key. So we got to have that great, call it a hypothesis, reasoning why we want, we're running this test, why we're doing this case study, what the problem was, and here are the results. Now what you stitch that together with is your methodology, what you found, and how you executed the implementation. Because okay. if you don't have that great opening, nobody's going to read it. And if they get to the end and it's like, oh, yeah, you increased traffic by 1%. Whoop-dee-doo. No, we increased traffic 1%, which, but by that 1% increase had a conversion rate of 50%, generating $1 million additional sales. We're going to, ooh. <laughs> and put the time frame in as well. So increase, one, you know, one sales, you know, by $1 million within 30 days. People can relate to that. But, you know, just increase traffic 1%, they're going to look at it a failure. Oh, that was $1 million in sales. Oh, yeah. Okay. I can see why that was a bonus or $100,000 in sales in 30 days. It gives them some perspective. Or, and I, and everyone knows me who's ever attended any of my analytics lecture, numbers on their own are meaningless out of context. Telling you I increase sales 100000 or a million, they're going to go, ooh, a million. But if I say I increase sales by 20% on 1% increase in traffic, that impressive number. Now, I don't know if you're going to get that, so I'm just giving you, <laughs> but that, that, that's an impressive number. We increased traffic 5%, but generating 10% increase of sales. Oh, that meant I got better quality traffic. And that's it. Put things in context. You know, you, if you're doing a project for a small business, that if they may, if they may only be selling $100,000 a month, but if through your effort for them, they took that sales to $120,000 a month, that's a 20% increase in sales. And that potentially is scalable to a client who's now doing a million dollars a month. And they're going to go, wow, I can, with, with their help, they could increase to $200,000. They're not going to balk at your services when you say, well, yeah, the bring my services is going to cost you $25,000. They're seeing, ooh, it can increase sales to $200,000 in a month. I'm going to pay them $25,000. That is a four times ROI in one month. And those sales are ongoing. That mm -hmm. part, that's that, that's that bottom piece of bread. It's going to be on the tongue where all the taste buds are. <laughs> so I'm, you, know, you know me in analogies. That's the taste you want to leave them with. Right. Well, and a lot of this, I, I go back to, for those of you that are familiar particularly with content um, marketing and writing, that it's important to tell a good story. You have to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And in the it, when it comes to case studies, the beginning obviously is outlining, okay, we had a problem. We were seeking a certain set of results. That's kind of the setup for the conflict, all right? The conflict, the middle of the story has to do with outlining exactly what was going wrong, how we identified what was going wrong, if that was the case, how we identified how we could fix what was going wrong. So that's kind of the meat of, you know, how we went about doing all of this. And then your end obviously is a nice wrap up with a great big fat bow on top as to, you know what, we know what we're doing. We identified this problem. We implemented these particular steps and voila, we solved their problem and now they're making bukus of money. And then what, could, what could be bad about that, right? Exactly. But that is the basic nuts and bolts of a case study. And I have to say, I have been really disappointed in a lot of case studies, not only that I see published, but particularly I see presented in that the information is so thin and I really don't get a good sense of beginning and middle and end. What, what exactly was the problem there? I, I, I missed that. You kind of just glossed right over that to sing the, your own praises. And, oh, we lost Alan. So give me just a moment to continue to explain while Alan hopefully comes back into the chat. Um, 
like I said, a lot of the case studies I see presented, I get presented all kinds of great, wonderful, woo, pretty numbers, but I don't always get to see enough of the context for me to go, oh, okay, that's what I really needed to get out of this. Um, so it's important that you, if you are going to create a case study, that you take the time to really outline and, and give the people consuming that case study, whether you're presenting it at a conference or whether you're publishing it on your website or in, you know, an established journal, here, here he comes back, that you make sure that you're actually providing enough narrative that we get the point of all those ooh shiny pretty numbers. Yeah, sorry, Michelle, I had a little technical glitch there. What else is new? <laughs> Quite all right. Uh, it's live. It's live and I'm outdoor on Wi-Fi. Uh, so, a Andrea uh, put a great point though, and I just lost that window. So, <laughs> I love it. So yeah, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna open this. that again. But if you want to read Andrea's comment, I'm closing that window down. It's right, right. Um, but she was talking about put numbers at the start, and that I, th I almost wanted. To, I can understand her point, and there's validity. This case, in which case, I would say this case study is going to talk about how this project. We believe we had this problem, and as a result, we increase sales by X percent. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an interesting premise. I will yield to Andrea. I just sometimes find, yes, I want to know that when I do get a case study, but after I get the number, am I going to read the whole case study? True. That is, True. That's one of the lemmas that I face with that kind of approach. Uh, the, Talking about that we had a hypothesis in this case study, we'll deal how we got that and how we increased traffic and sales. Okay, that's what I want to read. Uh, my, my personal, you know, uh, I you know love multiple people's feedback on that. You know, I'm open. I You know, I've never found the perfect case study. I've found my big problem with most case studies, it's rah, 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 look at what we did. It's not so much about look what our we did for our client look at the benefit our client received from this and i'm just using our client and saying look at you know look at what company x did by using our services and not raw raw drawing behind even though that's what we're doing it's and that's where i think the challenge of writing an effective case study is you everybody knows that you did it so you don't have to keep reminding them. It wouldn't be your right, case right. study. You wouldn't be putting a case study from, you know, you know, John Johnson in, uh, I don't know, in uh, Birmingham, England, if it wasn't associated with you. You know, hey, let's talk about the benefits of SEO. Let's look at the case study that this guy did. Well, then I'm going to hire that guy. <laughs> well, All right. Yeah, it's, it's like I said, what I was saying about telling a good story. So when we're reading fiction or just kind of sitting back and, and relaxing with something interesting to read, maybe it's a biography, maybe it's fiction, um, great stories enable the reader to identify with the story in some personal way and kind of see themselves in the part of the hero. And... I think that's part of what you're getting at here is that a case study needs to tell enough of the story that the reader can kind of see themselves in the part of that hero, that client in that story and go, oh, okay, I can actually see myself finding a solution to a particular problem by going through this process. So, it, you know, you've got to make sure that you're in, in some ways making the reader the hero of the story. Right. Because you can do this too. Now, you don't have the skills. We do. So hire us. But you can't say that. <laughs> you got to make them. But you want them to think about that. So part of the problem is, as consultants, I think this is where you and I need to, if we are writing case studies, and maybe I will get around to it since... Uh, <sighs> Filled everybody in the night. Where I'm about to write a case study. <laughs> but it is maybe talking about part of the problem when we talk about the opportunity in that introduction is client did not have a social media expert on staff, did not have resources who were familiar with social media 
or were not did not had looked at and couldn't find what was causing their loss of organic search traffic. So in that case, it is making us the star, and they hired us. Well, you're not going to say that. And so they conducted the search, and, or you know, they engage us in the audit, or engage us to implement. And then you can talk about what you did, but now it's the client is understood. So I think that's part of the opportunity too, is identify the problem. Why is the client coming to you? You're not going to say that they did a search and we were the lowest price. God forbid. I don't. I don't like winning contracts when I'm the lowest bid. It means I miss something. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when I lose a contract because someone's a lot cheaper, they may. And then we yeah, wait till you get all the uh, change control notifications, and the prices will be in the end more than us. Or they're going to do a crappy job because they didn't budget properly. Uh, it's. But we need to say, you know, here is the plum of that. And you want to make sure that a client who's reading this case study is going to go, yeah, my, you know, I only had interns available and the interns could not connect their day-to-day -day social media practices to the business goals and objectives correctly. That could be a part of a case study. Mm -hmm. Certainly it is. And, you know, that's why we're the professionals. <laughs> and, and I say that for those of you that are in-house as well as part of an agency or whatever. Yes, you are a professional and a case study is your opportunity to demonstrate that professionalism. And for, you know, new people into the industry, because I know very frequently, maybe not during the summer months, but as we get back into the fall and the regular school year, we also have a lot of um, university students that are a part of this conversation. And going through the process of being disciplined and creating that case study also helps solidify in your own mind what you learned from that process. So maybe you were the noob and this is the first time you've ever, say, implemented the Facebook tracking pixel and actually set up um, conversion events to track and see how customers were crossing from one device to another before they make an actual purchase, okay? Something very granular. But if it's the first time you've done it, um, sometimes writing up that case study is a way to solidify what you learn from going through that process with a new employer or a new agency or a new whatever. So case studies can even be valuable to the noobs as a way to help them learn and become more professional. Uh, definitely. Uh, definitely has a benefit to them. And, you know, that's part of the key is case studies, especially internally, it's we're let's say that not people aren't always going to be there forever who remember the stuff that ha had transpired in the past people move on and this is the hard part in organizations they don't leave time or budget for people to write up the case study the results and somebody people come and go and that knowledge leaves with them and the case study becomes a form of a formal documentation, or at least internal mm -hmm. reports. We had this problem, we did this, these were our results. Now, the new person coming in might say, oh, wow, well, you guys haven't been buying ads on Bing. We gotta go buy Bing ads. And and if the senior manager goes, oh, here's the case they, when they ran the Bing ads and they failed miserably compared to Google, or maybe it's the other way around. Why are you only running Bing ads? Why aren't you running Google AdWords? You can show the results. I don't want to show favoritism on one or the other. Mm -hmm. Oh, we got to do this kind of advertising. We've done it. And now they can see the testing. Oh, but I see something new that wasn't documented. Maybe there's a new feature or they didn't try doing it this way. It's an opportunity of internal documentation of what you've done. And so that people won't repeat your mistakes. Exactly. Now, use that to convince ownership managers when there's only so many hours in a day that they're willing to pay for and they already have you overloaded that they need to allow time for documentation because and white white uh case studies are documentation and that's one of my biggest pet peeves going to an organization who says oh we don't have time for documentation 
we're not going to pay for documentation. A year later, it's like, I may have worked on it. I don't remember it exactly because it wasn't properly documented. And it goes back to my days of coding when I was a great, and this people who know what I'm talking about, we write Perl script beyond belief. I could write, you know, 2,000 line Perl script and almost error free. I occasionally find a little bug and have to go fix it. And, but I didn't comment it because that took too long. I didn't write up a documentation of how things work. Great. It worked great until I had to do an enhancement a year later. And then I had to go, okay, I got to now spend, I may have written that in two hours or three hours. Now I got to spend two days to figure out what I'd done. So I know where to make the changes. So allow yourself time to document and case studies are the documentation of the results. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So we've got about oh, four more three, minutes, three, four more minutes. Yeah. Um, guys, for those of you participating both on the hashtag on Twitter or in our live chat on YouTube, by all means, if there are any final questions, comments that you have, be sure and hurry up and post them up. We're going to be closing out this um, live video in, in just a few minutes. But, Alan, while I'm waiting to see if anybody else has any final comments, do you have some parting words? Oh, tell your friends about social chat. <laughs> yes, please. We are working on some interesting guests over the summer months. Still waiting for some confirmations for some of them because I have to get guest one book before we can get offer dates to guest two. But we're working on some interesting ones. Come to our website, socialchatnetwork.com, where we, if you want to, post the link uh, because that's where we have a blog where you can find this YouTube ch uh, recording if you want to share it with your friends and uh, colleagues but tell everybody bring your friends next week we're here almost every Monday night the only Monday night I know we're not coming up because we learn you know we learn we did a chat on Memorial Day and Michelle and I had a lovely two-way conversation <laughs> so July 4th, we are not going to be doing a chat. Sorry for my uh, non-American uh, audience. There are two, few, we do get a few people out of Canada, but we have our Canada Day on the Friday before, on July 1. And our UK and Australian, they're going to be available, but they haven't been popping by lately because, well, whatever, it's not working for them right now. So we will apologize in advance, but go enjoy your fireworks if in you're in the U.S. Time. That's two weeks' time. Right. So coming up next Monday, just so you know, Dana Works is coming on and we are going to be discussing quite a bit about integrated content for nonprofits. So for those of you that are deep in the trenches of a nonprofit organization, we're going to be talking about integrated content, how to get the most out of what you're doing. Um, Everything from what type of content works best to um, nonprofit content strategies, all that kind of stuff we're going to be discussing with Dana next Monday. And that one is going to be a full Twitter chat. So we're going to be 100% on the social chat hashtag on Twitter next week to discuss integrated content for nonprofits. And for those who participated, you, you you can come to Social Chat Network and send us a comment, or you can tweet us comments. Let us know what you think about us using YouTube Live. We used to love Blab, but Blab's been getting, uh, what's the keyword, flaky? <laughs> uh, because, so we've, we've steered our way over here to YouTube Live, which is YouTube, which is Google, which is great. It's stable, and... Uh, well, there's, and I haven't noticed any major changes from the few weeks we've in between we've been doing this, unlike Blab, where, yes, it's a new product, and one day you can do chat, video chat and upload images, and next week you can't do something. So that's where we are, but let us know, because we're constantly looking at how we can evolve social chat, make it more engaging with all our audience. And all we're right. a social chat, and we like social feedback, and we do that's monitor amazing. the hashtag all week long, so... Fantastic. And on that note, I want to wish everybody a good evening and a great week this week. And by all means, if you guys decide that, hmm, this case study thing is something that I really need to be paying attention to, by all means, if you write and publish, 
tweet it back to us on the social chat hashtag and we will be happy to share your case studies. Perfect. On that note, good night, everyone. Go enjoy summer. <laughs>